everybody and welcome back to Prisma Chats. In this episode, I am talking to Alex Rohini, who is a developer advocate here at Prisma. Hi. Hello. How's it going? Hi. Um, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm just off, uh, sort of getting used to DevRel stuff after about three months of engineering. So yeah, I'm starting to get used to things now, yeah. Awesome, yeah, it's good to have you back on the team. I heard a lot about you. Um, <laughs> so to get right into it, uh, could you tell me about what you did in the past three months with engineering? Uh, okay, that's <clears throat> going to dive right into that. Uh, so for the last three months, I've been contributing to uh, potential commercial product, uh, the Prisma, the cloud app, uh, the uh, Prisma data platform. Uh, I've also been contributing to our design system and a few other libraries, like we have an internal um, database provisioning tool, which I contributed to that as well. Other than that, it's mostly been dumpster fires, shipping bugs to prod, fixing them, and then more bugs. Yeah, so yeah, that's been the whole cycle, but it's been fun and I've learned a lot. Yeah, are you happy to be back in Devrel? Yes and no. Um, it's sort of a 50-50 thing, to be honest, because on one hand, um, I do enjoy the frustration that comes along with engineering and then eventually fixing or doing whatever you've done and you can see it live in production mm -hmm. rather for us in, in preview. And then there's also the other side of me that still wants to explore content. Um, so the reason I would like to do more engineering is so that get more experience so that I can be able to create more technical and hopefully useful content for the developers out there. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, I know that we really need some of that technical content here at Debra, Um, because I am not the most um, fluent in any of these things. I'm very mm -hmm. new to the tech industry, so yeah that sort of content is very mm -hmm. much welcome and i can't wait to learn about what that entails how did you go from devrel to engineering like how did you get started with um, the engineering part uh, so engineering at prisma yeah oh okay so i started out at Prisma last year in November. Uh, and I was in my last year of uni. So a, a few months later, I think my last semester was ending on May. And therefore that's when I reached out to Nico um, asking about the next steps. Um, and given that he was also going to take a break, it, he thought, and I also thought it was a great idea to intern with the engineering team for the, for the summer and then get more experienced, which would also help back in DevRel. Awesome. Yeah, that's really cool um, yeah. that you went from like working in the thing to interning in another department. That's really interesting, actually. Shows how um, diverse you are and, and like how wide your skill set really is. So kudos to you. <laughs> But um, are you, you studying at the moment or are you finished? I finished by waiting graduation. Um, however, I joined Prisma as a working student. Oh, okay, okay. But um, what are some of these differences that you noticed about going from university to a company environment? Hmm. Well, um, the only thing that I can think of right now is you know the whole sort of degree of undergraduate expects you when you're taking a course or unit to sort of understand the whole topic so that for the exams or the finals however when it comes to engineering or devrel um, or rather out, out here um, in the working environment all you need is to learn just enough so that you can be able to 
be dangerous with that. I think <laughs> I've heard it some on the internet, but I think that's the one. Yeah. Yeah, dangerous. What's your <laughs> what's your biggest challenge at Prisma at the moment or in the past? It's not just challenge. I'd say it's challenges. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, working at a startup or rather at Prisma, it's been like a really amazing experience for me. I love working at Prisma, but sometimes it's easy to forget to sort of take care of myself. Hence the whole work-life balance yeah. uh, becomes tricky. The other issue is time zones. It's just time zones. Uh, adapting to time zones kind of, it's, I think, an, uh, if I'm to check, it's an 2.35 p.m. So it's an hour with a daylight savings time. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, time zones sort of suck because sometimes when you see a message, when someone's telling you at 2 p.m., you the my first impression was I didn't know they were specifying about their time zone. So you have to sometimes learn what time zone they're in and then do the necessary calculation, which sometimes is just a headache. Also when scheduling events, but um, adapting to it. Um, the other issue with time zones is that when I was in engineering, like my manager was in Canada, meaning they're about seven hours behind. <laughs> So he gets online when it's 4 p.m. my time. Um, and that's when he gives the, for example, pull request feedback or we mm. jump on a call to pair on a certain issue. So yeah, despite enjoying working, sometimes I just find myself working too late in the night, maybe just trying to ship that bug because I know the next time I'll get feedback will be way later in the day. So yeah. yeah. Uh, is it the same situation with your uh, manager being in Canada? Uh, well, that that is the situation with oh, my manager being in Canada, okay. having yeah. All right, yeah, uh, yeah. That's the the reality of working at a company that is so worldwide. We have people from really every corner of the world, um, which is great. But then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have yeah. situations like that where you're really working too late. Um, I hope that you find a solution to that. Uh, it's really not easy, even if everyone's living in the same time zone. I know that uh, I used to like exercise every single day, but I don't anymore because it's just I work eight hours a day and it's a lot. <laughs> and then I just want to chill afterwards. But uh, yeah, I think at the end of the day, I I also really like working at Prisma and it's really rewarding. And, and just also when a colleague came back, when Nico came back, he was like, mm -hmm. there was so much that was done and that uh, made me feel really proud. Cause I was like, yeah, we did all that. Um, but yeah, speaking of that, what do you like most about mm -hmm. working at Prisma? Wow, uh, there's a lot as well. I mean, it's everything, um, despite the time zones, I'm, I'm adapting to it. Uh, I like the openness and the transparency that's there. I like the whole energy and the vibe, um, the work culture, being remote, a remote fast organization, and that I'm always learning something new every day, even if it's not work related. It's about, for example, a few days ago, I just learned Australia has roughly five time zones with no daylight savings time. And we, we just have one single time zone with no daylight savings. So it's, yeah, that's that's how it is. Yeah, all those Slack channels are really doing their job, <laughs> especially social random. Yeah. yeah but it cool. is the only challenge is that it's a distracted world and you with me with my monkey brain end up being distracted yeah yeah um so we've had we talked about it just now we had a lot of things going on in the past couple of months but 
what was your favorite project or the project that excited you the most? It could be some that you're doing now as well. Um, I think I've mentioned, I have mentioned them before. Um, I got to also try out a little bit of design while in engineering, sort of, I know it's weird having to do design in engineering, uh, but it was mostly sort of trying to work, work on sort of two components for our design system to hopefully give our brand a unique identity. It was fun and also challenging because design just have to sit down and think of the perfect color that you can use and there are so many colors out there, but that's the thing with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, also contributing to our design system. Hopefully it becomes, it grows and others, since it's open source, I think people can use it and hopefully it becomes something others can also pick up and use. Mm -hmm. And also the internal tooling for the database provisioning service, which we were initially using it to test cloud, but now it's, given that it sort of has an API, we are using it in cloud, for example, to provision databases when someone creates a pull request. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That sounds yeah. really cool. That's actually. what it is. It is. Yeah. And it's also crazy, if that makes sense. Yeah. Having to work with such brilliant minds that are building these tools as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I see you already so glowy when you're talking about this. I can tell this makes you really happy. That's so nice. Um, but yeah, to continue on this high wave, what's a technology mm -hmm. that you get most excited about? I remember you asked me this during my interview. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, there was also that interview right before getting into engineering uh the interview yeah. so technologies that excite me i'll say not because i work at prisma uh, but prisma for sure sort of excites me for two reasons um so initially we just we prisma currently supports javascript or typescript and there's also a go client that's in preview and it was exciting to see someone in the community who created a python client from whatever's there so that was fun so I do hope to, I'm excited to see other languages being supported mm -hmm. and also the generators that Prisma supports. I mean, Prisma client itself is a generator. So, and people have built sort of tools on top of Prisma, like type GraphQL Prisma for generating a CRUD GraphQL API with just, without having to do a lot of work, which takes about five, two minutes max, um, if you count the NPM installs. There's an SJS one, there's one to, cre to create entity relationship diagrams, showing you visualizing your database models. There's also Nexus Prisma, which is still in access rather. And the community has built a lot and I think there's always going to be room for more. Yeah, mm -hmm. and can't wait to see what that space turns into and it's also GraphQL it's, it's been around for a while but it also feels like there's a lot done as well for example improving the tooling to be sort of frictionless you always have to reach out to the community sort of or npm to find sort of a, a package to help you integrate your back end and the front end um, there's also error handling and federation Craft you off. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. I mean, there's potential for all kinds of things to happen. Really good that there's a, a what did you call it for, for Python? A client for Python? The client. Yes, yeah. the Python client. For Python. Yeah, because yeah, mm -hmm. it's really the most well known programming language to be, and it will be cool to see something like that. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, but it yeah, is. speaking of languages, databases, what's your preferred stack? I know it depends on what you want to do, but what's like your go-to generally or lately? Okay, yeah. No, this is a topic that you, you 
sort of people avoid because might of course it will make someone on the internet angry at you because saying no you're wrong <laughs> use this uh, but my go-to stack is has to start with typescript because it saves me from myself and I, I don't know how else to say this but i or rather it's human to make a lot of error and of course i make a lot of errors and typescript just helps me reduce sort of the type errors yeah and like today i was actually using an application that was giving a cryptic error telling me i was trying to make a booking and she just told me booking failed and the error message was undefined this was not descriptive this couldn't help me in any way but mm. with tooling with typescript you can sort of get to the crux of such type issues um there's react however with nest.js um, I haven't tried Gatsby, but I think it's personally I think it's slightly overkill, slightly, but still a great tool. Uh, there's also GraphQL for the API layer, uh, Prisma, of course, for the database. Um, maybe Planet Scale uh, for my go-to database choice, and most importantly, um, React Query because it's just makes data hedging on the client side just seamless and fun make makes yeah. absolute feel snappy yeah awesome yeah cool uh seems like there's something there for everyone <laughs> um but yeah like when you think about people that are just getting started with um engineering programming coding anything in that sphere what would you advise them to learn first Wow, that's a tough question. And as always with every tech thing, it depends. Yeah. It depends. Okay, well, um, let me rephrase it. If, if you're starting fresh, what would you do first? Again, um, it depends in that, um, depending on the language you want to learn the platform you want to sort of build for and sort of the career path um just whatever's sort of on that path that you you would like to take um pick that language pick that tool and learn just enough to be competent at such and build projects and once you sort of have um a good understanding of what you're doing go deep uh, in that topic. So if it's HTML, for example, um, just learn the basics and then eventually you can go to the semantic HTML. The, there's accessibility, but um, there's just so many branches to take once you take a certain path. So just yeah. learn enough and build projects. And eventually, I think you have to learn data structures and algorithms, um, but it's not compulsory. And the internet will also disagree, but I think it's nice to know. Yeah. Okay. Wow, what a cool and thorough answer. Uh, yeah, those are all of my questions for you today. You answered them super nicely, gave me lots of cool information. And uh, I want to thank you for coming on the series today. And yeah, thank you for your time. Um, and for the viewers, I hope you enjoyed watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye, Alex. Bye, people. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>